We are joined here live in the KODX studios once again by Ari Cohn. He is the founder and president of the Post-Prison Education Program. Ari, thanks for coming in again and uh, spending an hour with us. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. So <clears throat> we are, uh, as the, the, uh, the, the, the underlying, one of the themes is uh, that we are in the midst of a pandemic, um, I'm merely pointing that out for historical purposes for when we <laughs> listen to these, Good. these interviews several years from now. And they're going, well, we're still in the pandemic. Oh, don't say that. We will be, but don't say it. I don't want to hear it. So um, I'm pretending like the Windermere Cup just happened, and I've got my Washington crew shirt on, and I'm ignoring the fact that it was canceled. I refuse to... <laughs> <laughs> now, see, that was making me wonder if you were on crew when, because you graduated from University of Washington. Yeah, I was wondering but, if maybe uh, I you was, I, when I came out of prison, I was fifty-two, so I, they wouldn't have let me even carry a shell, <laughs> get in one. <laughs> but it's, that and I don't know that and uh, women's volleyball. Those are probably and women's soccer are probably mm -hmm. my favorite. You love sports. I don't care if the football team comes or goes or disbands or moves to China, but but uh, crew's amazing. Uh huh. And so, so <clears throat> uh, it has been another busy month. There's been uh, numerous things happening on a lot of different levels. Obviously, um, COVID and the uh, the pandemic uh, is is affecting everyone, um, but uh, directly affecting people in prison. Yeah. Um, you, we were just saying before, while we were eating dinner before coming in, that uh, you were saying that um, one of the prisons is... Uh, Coyote Ridge down in Connell, where you've been with us before, now has more prisoners with COVID-19 than any of the other Washington State DOC prisons. And um, I, I think it was the Tri-City Herald that ran that article two days ago. And then I saw it on the Business of Prison Facebook page, and I think there were 28 men there and almost as many staff. And... Um, a lot, you know, a lot of people... Um, especially attorneys that are deeply involved. They have clients that are locked up or racial disparity, pro I mean, no, wrong, Disability Rights Washington, you know, who uh, and racial receivers have been on the show with me before. And uh, But people that are uh, Columbia Legal Services, people that are in contact with prisoners and their families all day long, every day, um, believe that it's going to snowball or it is snowballing and um, and I don't you know the way the governor's handling it is um, um, horrible I think I, I personally so all these l lawyers <laughs> think that it's going to just it may have already busted loose. There may, you know, because the DOC is purposely not testing. Uh, and so God knows how many people in the prisons have it and uh, staff and prisoners. And uh, um, but there's a belief that it's going to spread like crazy. And, uh, and I, and I, my, feeling about it is that Inslee is um, perp I think he and Steve Sinclair have made a purposeful decision to not test. You know, out of 18,000 prisoners to have tested fewer than 500 last time I looked, I think it's because they're fearful of what the answer would be. You know, if you had if you had a, uh, if tests verified a large number, then 
the Washington State Supreme Court, Barbara Madsen and that crew need to like, um, I'm not going to say it, but they need, they really are going to be looking like they're responsible for death uh, based on their negative decision on the Columbia Legal Services writ of And uh, because what would, the only way to deal with that, if, if it ended up that 2,000, 3,000 of Washington's prisoners have, have COVID-19, the only way you can social distance in the prisons is to reduce the population, right? And you can't release the population into nothingness which is what they've been doing. I mean, it's in the news, right? So they, they, uh, we're, we've spent a good bit of money and we're working our butts off um, with a guy that is one of the early releases and he, you know, mental illness, addiction, multiple times in prison and uh, his ERD was the end of the year, right? November and he gets told, he's advised by a counselor or somebody at, at the prison, uh, you're going home this week, right? And two days later, he's on the streets in Spokane. And, um, and we're 300 miles away, and we're not getting in zip cars, and which, you know, before COVID-19, we would be two or three of us in a zip car, and we'd be in Spokane, and we'd, you know, take him to a restaurant and take him shopping for clothes and put a cell phone in his hand and make sure that he was in an Oxford house in a clean and sober environment. That's not happening now. And um, so they're, but the, the, if, it, if they test and they verify high numbers, they have to release people. And if they release them, they cannot release them. They can't responsibly release them uh, without providing for housing and groceries and clothing and all these things that the DOC has traditionally flat out refused to do in the past. So... Um, I think, I think Inslee is, I was listening to him today and it's, uh, it's sad. And I want to switch over to a really positive event in, in a minute, and especially since I'm on the subject of sports, even though I won't be won the mayor cup, but, but, um, uh, you know, he's like, it seems like he's concerned. He has great concern for everybody but prisoners and former prisoners, and he doesn't even mention them. So there's a significant part of Washington's population, and they're locked up, and they have family. You know, Washington's prisoners, like 80-some percent, have on average 1.92 kids or something, so almost all of the prisoners have two kids or more. And then they have parents and aunts and uncles, and so it's a, it's a big part of Washington's community the Washington State community, and Inslee is just like, let's just keep them over here in this box with a lid on it and not even discuss them. Let's just pretend like there's no prisons in this state and, uh, and there are no prisoners and there's no kids whose mom and dad are locked up. Let's just, this is not even a topic we're going to discuss. We're going to pretend it doesn't exist. So it's just... Uh, I saw a comment on, uh, there's a lobbyist, uh, Nick Federici, who's uh, on my Facebook, and I've known him for years, and he was praising Inslee the other day. Um, but I think he was, and I, I think he was praising him because of what Inslee's doing with, with COVID-19, which I think, other than with prisoners, is, is fabulous. I think he's doing a, a really great job, I think. The governor of California, Inslee, the you know the mayor of New York City. I think they're doing really. They're really dealing with it. I think as responsibly as you can, except for the issue of prisoners. But I hate I hated to see Nick say that on Facebook because if he knew what Inslee's doing and not doing for prisoners, you know, then maybe he wouldn't be such an Inslee supporter. So. Anyway, that's uh, so Coyote Ridge is out in Connell. Uh, it's the largest prison in the state. Um, and according to the Tri-City Herald, there's 
I think there's now it's probably more, but it, there, as of the other day, 28 prisoners with with COVID-19 and some amount of staff. And you know what really um, is troublesome, or um, is is I've got friends down there who work for the Department of Corrections, and. Uh, and then we've got applicants and students. So there's people we've been working with for the last, for six months or for a year, preparing them for release and getting them registered and getting them enrolled and, and making plans and, and where, where are you going to release to and what school are you going to do and, and da 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 da. But I, I've, I've got uh, um, friends on staff down there in the education department and in, in custody. Uh, that are really truly friends, uh, and um, um, and I, you know, worried about them. You know, this one I'm not going to name her, but she's an assistant superintendent down there, and I I met her at the Washington State Penitentiary a long time ago, and um, uh, and then she and she's sort of been all over the state, but she's a really good person, and so she's. She's uh, DOC transferred her from Purdy back out to Connell, and so she's caught up in this, and you know, and, and, and so it's it's there's a lot of good people on both sides, prisoners and DOC staff, and it's their you know their lives are at risk. It's horrible. So I'm going to switch gears. Um, the uh, in 2012, uh, uh, a, a woman, Jen Harmon, who, by the way, if people are even half as bored with listening to me as I am listening to me week in, you know, month after month, where we haven't been able to have anybody, you know, we've had lots of guests on this show, but since COVID-19 hit, we haven't been able to do that, and um, I can't get hand off Bainbridge Island. I can't get Taylor out of White City and and so on. And we certainly can't get Mark Stern up from Olympia or whatever. And uh, uh, but July second, our next show, Jen Hammond will be on, and 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 I'm going to talk about her and maybe Hannah Myrick, who hopefully is going to be able to do a, a, a backstories interview with her. Um, will be on with her, but I won't be here. <laughs> I guarantee you I will be <laughs> at Green Lake <laughs> listening on my phone or something. But but we'll in 2012, see. we got this, um, you know, it's kind of cool. We get, we get like yesterday alone, I get, I got a email from a student in London, right, who is, wants to do her master's degree thesis uh, on reentry and and use our students in our work is the basis for that, and so we we get that all the time. I mean, it's it's uh, somehow we've got a uh, over the years we've become known or whatever got a, with, the, with an internet presence or something, and and but we so anyway. In a comparable thing, but it was from Seattle, not London. Uh, Jen Hammond. Uh, wrote to somebody who worked with me in 2012 and she just and she talked to, she was at Seattle University and and um, was finishing her undergrad in in uh, a particular kind of psychology and and she was also majoring in philosophy right and we had the transition house um, that uh, went, that we had we taken over this transition house uh, on the south end of Capitol Hill. It was a disaster. It was like Home Street Bank was getting ready to foreclose on uh, on Interaction Transition, which had had this transition house for forty years, and uh, really really bad management. Uh, they had lost their funding from Lucky Seven Foundation, lost their funding from United Way, and now and then Home Street Bank was after them. But but there were 28 men and women, 
in that transition house, and every one of them was was on probation for a sex crime. And the DOC didn't want that house to to be foreclosed, and I was. Uh, um, speaking uh, at city council on housing and I'm walking out the door and um, one of their board members came up to me and asked me if we'd be interested in getting involved and and we did so part of what why Jen's idea was she want she's a, a great writer and she wanted to um, help men and women who were students of ours, but I think particularly that were in this transition house, which was really close to SU. I mean, it was up on 16th. And, and, uh, and so, so she had one day a week that she could volunteer with us. And she came into the office and, um, and she quickly engaged with, with, with applicants and students and residents at that transition house that we had. And, uh, and she became like an integral part of the program. Right. And she was free, which was wonderful. <laughs> it's like, so, and she was passionate, motivated. And, and then like one day, um, I mean, I, I never thought of her as being athletic. Right. And I, I didn't know anything about her personal life, and um, and if if you if she's listening, and she, I hope she won't like shoot me or beat me up or box my nose or whatever, because she's capable of it. But 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 uh, she, uh, I just never thought of her as an athlete. I just was thinking of her as a philosophy major from SU who was really smart and motivated. And so one day she sort of stands up at her desk. And she said, I'm quitting because I'm going to train, be training six days a week to, with the goal being to get on the Olympic team, to go to the Olympics, right? And, and that's like, that's not the normal <laughs> statement around my office, right? And I was, I was just sort of flabbergasted and I didn't know whether it was realistic or not. I'm looking at somebody who's, I don't know how tall she is, but I later found out because weight classes with boxing come into play. I later found out she was like 127 pounds, which, you know, is kind of heavy for some women, but it, she didn't look 127 pounds probably because muscle weighs more than fat. I don't know, but she just, um, I just never thought of her as an athlete and here all of a sudden she's announcing she's quitting to train six days a week. And the, the objective was to, to call to be, become a member of the, uh, of the Olympic boxing team. And honestly, I don't know. I don't even remember if my act, what my real was going on in my mind, but it, I'm sure it was like, I hate losing her from the office. Um, and then she sort of disappeared, right? And she, she, she was training, she had been training at a, a gym that was sort of well-known for boxing at the time up on Capitol Hill. And it got a lot of, there was a lot of adverse um, talk about this gym, and I'm not going to name it. And so she switched coaches to this woman, Tricia Arcaro, A-R-C-A-R-O. Um, and... Some and so, and somehow we ended up with and Trisha Trisha had a, a gym under construction on Capitol Hill and it's it is it's fully operational it's closed for COVID nineteen but and I did a WebEx yesterday with with Jen and she was at Arcaro Boxing and with with the my my dog that she stole from me years ago Moose which I wish it was my dog but anyway and. Uh, and uh, anyway, they're like, um, so they, they have, the, the gym hasn't opened yet. So on weekends, they would haul the heavy bags that you box with over to this park up on Capitol Hill. And we had students and board members and, um, and, and Trisha was like Jen's coach, you know, 
teaching people to box and and uh, um, you know Jenny Burton who just won the Truman Scholarship and uh, uh, UW was was in that group and and uh, anyway so our connection our became these weekend things where Trish would coach students and and board members and staff that wanted to be coached and and um, then all of a sudden there was a fundraiser on Capitol Hill and some business had done had offered their place and you know crackers and cheese and wine and grapes and all that and Jen was going to do a demonstration a boxing demonstration with with Trisha uh, and the idea was it was they were trying to get money to go to the nationals and uh and so what happened was i i remember it was crowded and we had a former board member ally mcgregor and june was with me and and we're standing behind jen so her back's to us and that so jen uh, or trisha is facing us with these boxing bits, which look like catcher's gloves, right? And um, uh, and I hadn't seen. I told her yesterday. I said, I said I didn't see anything that was impressive. It was just like kind of like lazy punching at the boxing gloves, and it was almost boring. And then all of a sudden, she just cut loose, lightning speed, like. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> And June and I looked at each other like, what the F was that? <laughs> you know? And so that, we knew she was for real. It was unbelievable how fast she was. And we were just like stunned. And um, I think I wrote a check that night for 1000 Allie might have written a check for $2,000. And, and, but the idea was to cover their hotel expenses. The Nationals that year were in Spokane, which was way better than being on the East Coast where the expenses would have been higher. So they, we, pay, we kicked in more money, and I think the gym put our logo on their website or something. Um, and, um, and the long and the short of it was she won the Nationals. So, so this this person who stood in my office, who I didn't even know could spell boxing, didn't know was an athlete, you know, left. And, and very quickly, uh, the whole story I'm going to tell you happened so quickly. And then like Jen and I were talking about it last night on this WebEx, it was just lightning speed fast what transpired. And um, uh, But so very quickly, she's... Um, She's in Spokane, and she won the Nationals in her weight class. And the next day, she's on an airplane to Colorado to the U.S. Olympics team, right? That fast. And I think she was in training with the Olympics team for a month, and they left for South America for the championship for the whole hemisphere, right? And she won that in her weight class. So it was like, it was just extraordinary. So, um then I uh, cut how that relates to prisoners is, you know, we've had some, uh, over the last 15 years, we've had some really amazing, just positive, super incredible things happen along with some awful, you know, sadness. And, um, and, uh, when, when, um, and one of the, the coolest things, I think we do a lot of things that we're not known for, you know, you know, so we, um, you know, we help people who are doing life sentences who are rehabilitated and turn their lives around or should have never been locked up in the first place, get free. And we've, we've, you know, we, we testify with the indeterminate sentence review board. We, 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 uh, provide support when people are released by ISRB. We uh, just do all kinds of things that we're not known for. And, and in fact, uh, and I'll come back to it in a minute, but so one of the things that was a super cool moment in our history 
that nobody would know about it, but but had been there was like after Gen won the whole damn hemisphere championship, right? Um, and and so by the way, in the middle of that, she went. We all went down to Tacoma, and she won the Golden Gloves for the state. And we saw that match live, you know, and it was a tough. Tough, tough match, and but, but it gets lightning fast, and and um, and um, so anyway, I asked her, I, and I, I and I'll preface this so like I get asked a lot about what the difference we see between in with prisoners in men's prisons and and prisoners in women's prisons, and I think the overriding. Thing that always comes to my mind is is men get through imprisonment with anger. I mean, you know, they're PO'd, they're angry, uh, uh, but they're not like caved in, uh, broken down. You know, they're like fighting and and, and, and and sometimes fighting in a positive way, sometimes fighting in a negative way. But there's a lot of anger in men's prisons, and there's a lot of energy. And we don't see that in women's prisons to the point that going into the women's prisons can be extremely sad. I, I have never met and do not ever expect to meet a woman who's in, in a prison who, isn't, who hasn't suffered every kind of trauma that there is, physical, sexual, verbal, um, you know, and caught up in addiction, just just battered and broken down a thousand ways to hell and back to the point that it's it's just really it's sad and you know we do q and a's after these presentations and meetings we do in prisons and 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 you know you if you're like in the gym at belfair and with 80 women then you get swarmed and they're and and so you're and you're hearing about they lost custody of their kids, and they're hopeless, and uh, and addiction, and they've never been able to overcome it in the past, and they hope to after their next release, and battering, and it's just it's just it's really just horrible. So, I asked Jen if she would go into the women's prison at Purdy and do a boxing demonstration with Tricia. And talk about this short little history that I just discussed, and talk to the women about dreaming dreams, and you know having hope, um, and because hope will carry you through, and uh, um, and then if you run into somebody like us, and where we just instead of running our effing mouths, actually deliver with concrete support as often as funding allows, then, then it's good to have hope because it takes you somewhere. And so, anyway, Jen agreed, right? And so it, I worked with DOC headquarters and because there was a lot of stuff. Like, they, they didn't like the idea of white powder, you know, which, you know, which is necessary, you, you know, before you tape up and you're putting on gloves and all that. There's this white talcum powder stuff. And then the gloves themselves and all of that stuff that we took in was concerning. But we got the department to work with us and, and, and cleared it, right? I mean, honestly, we have, for years, we have not had good support. In fact, quite the opposite with, with the women's prison at, at Gig Harbor. It's just... Um, We've had amazing support with the men's prisons, but as of when uh, they took this assistant secretary, assistant superintendent who was in charge of programs, and they moved her to Monroe years ago, and then and that just stopped it. And so, uh, uh, so even with DOC having approved Jen and Tricia coming in to do this demonstration and tell Jen's story. When we hit, when we arrived at the prison, we had a hell of a time getting the boxing gloves in, and getting that talcum powder, and getting the tape, and getting the mitts that the coach holds, and all that in. But we finally did it, and 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 so, and they did they did uh, a demonstration where Trisha is holding these 
like catcher mitt things, and John is just pow, pow, you know. And but the main story was to deliver hope to these women in in this prison, and um, it was an ama- it was amazing, you know. And, and and the whole the whole idea was like, who who in their right mind would ever say, I'm going to quit working this job. And I'm going to start training six weeks because I want to be on the Olympic team, right? But that was her dream, and then and then and and um, and she made it happen. And and you know, so you have a dream, you work hard at it, you have a plan that allow you to. Re- so that was the message we took in that day, and it was just it was fantastic. And then and then, sometime later, she was having headaches. Um, and she ended up in the hospital. And as, as I remember it, she got up out of the bed to walk to the bathroom and collapsed. And it turned out she had brain cancer. So the last time I saw uh, Jen Harmon until last night, uh, her head was shaved bald. And she had gorgeous hair. It was like, oh, my God, don't cut that hair. <laughs> and And... From from chemo, right? And I thought she was going to die, and we talked about it last night. I really, I thought she was going to die, and and um, and she beat that. So, so she, you know, so now she's her hair is coming back. It's it's you know, getting it's, you know, you can't tell she was ever bald. The 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 basset hound that was seven, a brand new puppy back in 2012 is now seven years old. <laughs> And um, um, and she's coaching boxing now, and she's getting ready to move to Pittsburgh to get her PhD in psychology. Um, and, and she so she, so um, anyway, that's I just think dreaming dreams is you know having dreams and realistic hopes, and then being willing to make plans. It's just a it's just a key. Th- thing that's so important to the environment that, that we care about, prisoners and former prisoners and their families, just not being hopeless, not like being battered down, but, but, but just dreaming dreams like Jen did and then working your butt off and making them happen. And then you hit adversity, brain cancer, and you overcome that, you know. And then you bounce back, and now she's coaching boxing and – headed for her PhD. She has a master's degree. So she's, she'll be here our, ne- our, our July show, uh, July 2nd, I think it is, um, and uh, has agreed to talk about all this. And I'm hoping that Hannah will have interviewed her by then or at least will escape Bainbridge Island and be here with her. But if not, I'll, I'll be here with Jen. But the the guest will be will be Jen. So, um, I uh, um, thought I, I, we we wrote the largest check, completely switching gears that we've ever written in 15 years in a single disbursement on behalf of a prisoner um, about two weeks ago, and almost $13,000. So we've spent 20000 on one student, uh, seventeen on another, 10 or more on a lot of students. Um, but we've, I, we've never, but that's like housing and groceries and maybe a lawyer and this, that, and the other, and bus passes spread out over years, right? Um, for us to write a check for $13,000 um, in one disbursement on one day for one person, um, is extraordinary, and uh, I want to. I'm not going to name this prisoner's name, uh, 
but I kind of want to talk. I want to talk about not only about her, but the circumstances that she lived through that caused her to be in prison. But I want to talk about the Clark County legal system and and Republican haters. You know, it's it's so. Um, it's so bad that you can, you know, if, if there's a, if somebody's been, commit an exact, a crime in this county and your, your sentence is going to be mild, moderate, commit the exact same crime in another county like Spokane or, or Clark County, Vancouver's legal system just sucks. And, and you can expect or Mason County. I mean, you could, you just, it, you know, I, when Pam Roach was in the Senate from, from Auburn, you know, I used to think like, what, what kind of people would ever vote for this hater, imbecile, horrible person? But you can, you can tell a community by who they send to Olympia, right? Um, and uh, like Matt Shea from, from Spokane Valley. And anyway, so this, um, Years ago, Don Wilchus uh, and I were invited by a Rotary Club, a small Rotary Club. Out at Gig Harbor has like, they're like Baptist churches in the Western North Carolina mountains. There's one Rotary Club on every street corner, right? There's little teeny ones all over. They're like the measles. And a little, um, a little, uh, um, Rotary Club goes used to go into Purdy to the women's prison outside of Gig Harbor and do like reentry classes. And Don and I were invited to go down and talk to that group one evening. And I was so impressed because there was a woman in there who basically was never going to get out. And she was in there working in partnership with this Rotary Club with women who were close to the door about to release. And I'm like, I, I was really, that woman caught my eye. Um, and I thought that was really amazing and selfless. And, and uh, so she was like helping women prepare for something she m might not ever experience. And, and, um, and so that was the first time I noticed this person. And then, when in subsequent years, when we would go down and do these dog and pony shows at Purdy, um, this woman, um, she, you know, you carry yourself well. You have good posture. You you hold your head up high, um, and you 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 handle your life responsibly. And and uh, and and I'm not gonna. Um, Talk. She's she's uh, mixed race, and um, I'm not going to talk about religion. But she dresses in accordance with her religion, and is always just just carries herself well. And uh, and and she was always with a friend of at, at the table for Jean, before Jeanette Murphy released. Um, she was always at the table with Jeanette. And but she never said anything. But I just noticed her because the way she carried herself. And she, for years and years and years, she would she would come to our presentations, and there she would be at the table. And I just was so like last year, um, we went down and met with a small group of women, maybe thirty five women, and I took Jenny Burton with with me and. Um, and some other people, uh, Joe Jensen and Chris Beasley, and uh, and we walked into the, this meeting room, um, and the woman I'm talking about saw Jenny, who she knew because she had been locked up with Jenny before, right? And Jenny saw her. And Jenny's crying because she's still locked up, right? And this woman that we're heavily invested in now is crying because Jenny's out and just doing spectacularly well. Um, 
and I'm just gonna. By the way, our latest backstories interview that that Hannah did was with Anamari Kause, and it uh, we published that to our list serve last Monday. The next one is on Jenny, and the the uh, Hannah's already finished the interview a month ago, and uh, and actually videoed it. It was a WebEx interview and that's coming out on the 14th of this month which is a uh, sunday and it'll release about two o'clock so anyway so jenny sees this woman and she and she's crying because she's still locked up and at that point i think 23 years and the woman is crying because jenny's out and doing so well and uh, and so i after years and years and years, and then what happened was after the presentation, they broke into little groups, and 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 so one of the one of the students of ours was there. You know, some women gravitated to her, and and then this woman gravitated to the group with with um, with Jenny, and. Um, and it was just a very emotional day, and so I, I made it a point to find out like what was her story. And um, you know, the story her her story is, um, you know, through childhood, sexual and physical trauma and violence, right, um, including from her father, right. Um, and then her husband and, um, and then she, and then she's got two, she's got young children and she's being battered and her life is so bad that she decided that the best thing for her and her children was to end their lives. And she started that process but then she realized that was the wrong thing to do. And she loaded herself and her kids up and went to the hospital and nobody died. And Clark County juris legal system hit her with almost a 50 year sentence. She's been down, uh, 23, 24 years. And, 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 I think she shouldn't have spent a day in prison. I think treatment was called for. I've talked to lawyers in Satterberg's, you know, office up here, including his two chief deputies and, and especially Carl Lee. And, you know, up, up here, what was, what's called for was treatment. But in Clark County, these hater, I mean, I really want to use profanity here and FCC can kiss my butt. Uh, uh, it just, um, but they responded with this God awful sentence. I mean, but you know, so here's a woman that's like battered, abused by her dad, then gets into a marriage, abused by, by her, her husband, um, postpartum depression on meds and treatment was called for, but Clark County responded with this massive sentence. So I'm so, uh, uh, um, I contacted a lawyer and paid her to go out to Purdy and meet with this woman four or five months ago, right? And the lawyer agreed with me. And um, there have been, and, and so there's a lot has gone on since. And, and, um, uh, and our our hope is to have the governor uh, sign papers and let her come home, and uh, and and so um, I almost I had you know I had uh, this is some of what I asked the lawyer to just kind of give me a recap so I could give it to my board of directors. And, and if people thought I was wacko for spending 13,000 on this one issue, but you know, like complex lengthy trauma history plus Zoloft postpartum depression 
And at a very young age, super early 20s, um, no history of abuse of her kids, superficial wounds only. When she got to the hospital, only superficial wounds. Like, no, you know, nobody was near death. And, she, you know, she got him help. And uh, the father was a long-term abuser of her and, 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 and her mom. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a, an emotional, psychological, and physical history that's horrible. And, and uh, uh, it just goes on and on. Uh, her ex-husband, so the guy before the husband was abusive. And, uh, and she actually asked, she searched for support. You know, she, she got a restraining order against her husband. Didn't work. She sought help at hospitals. Uh, uh, you know, she was actually tested for depression, scored off the chart, was prescribed Zoloft. So there was all this anguish and trauma, and treatment was called for. And the, the MF blank, blank, these assholes, I hope that's legal, isn't it? All right. And, 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 and Clark County responded to this great need and sadness with this monster prison sentence. So I'm, I'm hoping to see her home. And, uh, and we're, we're heavily invested in that. And so, um, and I can tell you a lot of stories like that, actually. Uh, we, we, uh, there's a guy who just got transferred from Walla Walla to Clallam Bay. It's a street, three strikes conviction. And, um, and I want to get, and, and he was a student of ours. He was out, and, and, uh, and I want to get him. I want to get these people that, I'm, my fear is I'll die of old age, right? And these things that I want to accomplish won't get accomplished before I die, and then they won't happen. So I'm trying to get these things in motion so that they're far enough down the track that I could, like, get hit by a metro bus and it wouldn't matter. It would still there will still be a happy ending. So um, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's. That's inspiring. I don't know. <clears throat> it, you know, she's got more, nine more years to go. It's just like, that's average. I did five years in the feds. I, I told somebody the other day, I was on a, WebEx with a nonprofit that works with people in prison in San Quentin, and they've got supporters all the way to New York City. And I was on this WebEx or Zoom, whatever. Uh, people were like in Canada, San Quentin, uh, or Oak Oakland, New York. And one of the guys that was on the, the Zoom had done like 21 years or 27 years or something. And I was like, you know, I, I did five. That was enough for me. Thank you very much. I can't imagine having done, you know, 25, 27 years. I mean, I actually can't imagine, which, which is why it's so abhorrent to me. And, um, and so this lady's done 23, 24 years and has nine to go and should have never been locked up for a day. She absolutely should have never been locked up for a day. Um, it's just... Uh, um, I, don't, I don't have no words. I don't have words adequate to describe my feelings about that. It's like um, so. Change the subject. Ask me something. <laughs> it's just like all right. We've got uh, about ten minutes left. Um, so one of the the, the themes that you. Um, regularly weave into the stories <clears throat> that you share with us is that you, the post-prison education program seems to prefer um, folks who are the greatest challenge. Yeah. Why is that? It, it would seem, it would seem from a, um, maybe a common sense standpoint. That's like, why would you risk all these resources on people that are like the highest risk and, and the greatest potential um, failure rate or loss to your organization if, um, if they do fail? Because nobody else will. I mean, really, that's the honest to God answer. Nobody else is doing it. The Department of Corrections isn't doing it. The effing Washington State Legislature, there's nobody there even 
having that discussion. Uh, you know, when we were in litigation with these researchers that, that I fired in 2015, one of them under oath at downtown Superior Court talked about the fact that nobody works for the people that we work for, you know, which are high risk to recidivate, seriously mentally ill, addicted, co-occurring disorders. And, you know, I, uh, we talked about it at town hall, October 9th. And it just was a, a guy from Amazon wrote me two days ago and they're looking at, uh, I don't, couldn't tell whether it was like, him and a bunch of co-workers from Amazon or Amazon official, but whatever the question was like, we're, we want to know how you spend money. We're looking at maybe substantial support and we want to know how you spend money. So I'll, these are, so I'm like, um, what I sent him the, um, article that UW just published about Jenny getting the Truman Scholarship. And then I pulled three P&Ls. So I pulled a p and it, it was funny. I didn't know we could juxtapose multiple people's P&Ls in one document. I thought I had to do like three separate P&Ls and I stumbled into... And so I, I got like Shelley Clear, uh, Keith Whiteman, and Jenny Burton, and um, Shelley, we worked with for three to four years. Keith was ten years. Jenny, you know, uh, we met in two thousand ten, and still are involved. And and her son is a student of ours, and he comes out of prison in forty five or sixty days, and. Uh, and so they're the answers, you know, they're the, an why, 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 you know, we used to have a, a, a page, a section on our website. It was like, cause we get asked, why, why do you, why do you, why do you help? Why do you do this? And we, and the stories that of the lives that these people have lived or, or, or the why that's our motivation, but the, you know, I mean, ask ask Keith Whiteman or Shelley Clear or Jenny Burton uh, where they would have been if we hadn't gotten involved, you know. And you know, s s not not everybody. Um, we've been heavily involved uh, with some people who haven't made it. You know, Don and Joe Jensen were on the show months ago talking about uh, Joe's nephew, Joey, who died from suicide, you know. And we were heavily, heavily, heavily invested in him, and he had become close friends of all of ours. One of the most traumatic, horrible moments of my life was getting a text message at like 10, 10, 10 one night from Joe Jensen and she was at Harborview with Joey, and the text was just, he's in the last moments of his life. That's, <laughs> you know, and uh, so not everybody succeeds, but, but uh, so many have, you know, and, and, and so, and that, uh, that, that we can do that, you know, when funded, with funding, you know, we, we can do that. Minus funding, we can't. Um, mediocre funding somewhere in the middle between starving to death for money and, and optimally funding, you know, there's some successes and some misery, but, but we know how to do it and we've proven it over 15 years and, 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 and the, the, those lives are, are, are why, you know, it's like, um, plus I think it's, it's, it's a, it's such a tr it's a tragedy that this, like, I'm going to just say, God be damn worthless state has criminalized serious mental illness, you know. And that's something the legislature allows. 
um, the governors, one after the other, Gary Locke, Chris Gregoire, Inslee, I've known so many DOC secretaries, Harold Clark, Ellen Vale, Dan Pachoki, Bernie Warner, you know, rotten hell, Bernie. And, you know, Steve Sinclair, and, 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 and everybody seems to be fine with lock them up. Don't help them. Don't provide treatment. Just lock them up. Throw away the key. And, you know, like I talked at Town Hall, there was this one guy, Jeremy Polston, who's sitting in, in the special offender unit at Monroe for his 10th incarceration. And, and, um, and uh, it, it was meeting him through the Department of Corrections asking us to get involved with him that really caused me to, to focus, to, you know, to focus on people with mental illness. It was like, until I got that call from DOC in 2010, I'd never heard of schizoaffective disorder. I'm just a dumbass country boy from Central Florida with like horse manure between my toes. I never heard that word. I had to look it up on Mayo Clinic. And, um, uh, but the, the idea that that we would that our that this society's answer to some serious mental illness is imprisonment is outrageous. I mean, really, it's outrageous. Or, you know, you punish, um, you know, Jenny and I mean Keith and uh, Shelley talked about it in that movie that Brave New Films did um, about our work with addiction. But you know, a parent introduces a child at six, eight, or 10 to drugs, and maybe mental illness is there or comes into the picture later, how does that make that kid be a badass that should be locked up? You know, it's just like none of that makes sense to me. And, and so my only answer to that is to fight it. And, you know, somebody wanna, some people like, I guess so many damn people on my Facebook is ridiculous, and 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 I don't know how they got there, but it's like I don't know how my first wife got pregnant. I can't figure that out yet. But it's like, but all these people just like they're on my LinkedIn, they're on my Facebook, and it's like, and they they seem to think the answer to all the maladies is to just click and post this vitriol. It's like the ah, DOC is a bunch of whoremongers, and and then the cops are this and the, this and that, and and just click click. You know, like, love, hate, all these Facebook emoticons and, and, um, and just vilify this and vilify that. And, and they think that's the solution for all, this, all these maladies. I think the solution is fundraising and grant writing, getting money, and helping people with rent and housing and clothing and education and building lives worth living. And I did that perfectly. We got one minute to go. So how can people find out more about post-prison education programs? Well, you know, Hannah's done a great job building up our website, and, and she's got this blog going. So, like, the last interview, it, so go to the website. It's postprisonedu.org. Check out the blog. The interview that we just, that Hannah did with Anna Morikowski is just extraordinary. You know, uh, join our listserv. Look for the... Um, you know, sign up on our Facebook page. The Anamari Kelsey interview is going to go up on Facebook uh, at 10 o'clock this Sunday morning. We'll put it on Facebook. Um, and so, so get you know, go to the website. Uh, if you want to get involved in any way, shape, or form, we're like Cisco WebEx teams, WebEx calling, WebEx meetings. You know, send an email to us. You know, uh, to me. Uh, all of us at postprisonedu.org, whatever, and, and we'll get back to you, and we can get into WebEx and answer questions and, you know, and, and so on. But that's the deal. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time, but uh, we'll have your some of your crew and or. <laughs> yeah, at least Jen Harmon. All right. Yeah. Next month. Yeah. July 2nd.